morning. I greet you in the name of our Savior Jesus on this beautiful day that the good Lord has given to us that we can be gathered here in his house, gathered around his word and sacrament, ready to receive his Easter blessings. Right? Um, so uh, in terms of announcements, because I want to get right into this here today, uh, first of all, I want to say thank you to our board of elders for the lovely breakfast this morning. Good job, guys. You can get Now, if you didn't come for breakfast, you can still smell a little bit of the bacon wafting, but by the end of this service, it's not going to be around anymore. So if you had come to early, you would have had it full bore, okay? <laughs> Fair enough. So in terms of announcements, I just got this stuff. F3 begins again this Wednesday, so there will be confirmation and dinner at 6, and then Bible studies at 7. And Sheila's covering for me at, at confirmation at 6, and Todd is covering for me in my Bible class at 7, because this week, God willing, uh, I'm getting a week of rest. Please, God, please, I need a week of rest. Um, then, um, and the dinner on uh, Wednesday is Sloppy Joe's and Mac and Cheese, yes? Okay. Then, uh, you're getting an email from me on Tuesday if my computer behaves, asking you if you want to take part in this monthly Bible class I'm going to start at the end of April, Watch the Chosen with the Pastor. And when I first uh, thought about this, I thought we might have eight or maybe 10, and I think we might have like 40. So if you are intending to attend, please let me know. Please RSVP with that email, because uh, I'd love to have you know, 80 for this class. We're figuring out a way to do it in here if we need to. So, uh, but if we're going to have a big group, I need to know like you know, more than two days before we're doing the class. So please RSVP if you're planning on attending that. Then Men's Bible Breakfast is starting a new study this Saturday, uh, Home Run King. Uh, so that'll be at 8 a.m. this Saturday in the library. And then uh, for birthdays this week, I've got Christy Timer on Wednesday, Beverly Calvert, and Carol Williams on Friday. So happy birthday to you guys. All right? Uh, yeah, happy birthday. So uh, anything I'm forgetting, Sheila? Okay. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right. Then let us begin with our first song, and it is a hymn. You cannot start an Easter service. Oh, that's right. I forgot. Bells. Bells, do your thing. I'm so ready to get going here, you know.
Good job, guys. All right. Now, what I was saying before, for our first song today, which is a hymn, because you can't start an Easter service without singing Jesus Christ is Risen today, we stand to sing this song. And thank you to, thank you to Ben for playing the trumpet today. Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, but with you there is forgiveness. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, Confess to you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your punishment now and forever. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession, by virtue of my office, as a called and ordained servant of the word, 
announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated for our next song. directing traffic up here today. The Old Testament reading this morning comes from the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, beginning with the first verse. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness when Israel sought for rest. The Lord appeared to him from far away. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. Again, I will build you, and you shall be built, O virgin Israel. Again, you shall adorn yourselves with tambourines, and shall go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. Again, you shall plant vineyards on the mountains of Samaria. The planters shall plant, and shall enjoy the fruit. 
For there shall be a day when watchmen will call in the hill country of Ephraim, Arise, and let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christ has risen from the dead. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. The epistle reading this morning comes from the third chapter of the letter to Colossians, beginning with the first verse. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, our Easter vocal choir will come up and share with you our musical offering.
The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 28th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. We now confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this time you may be seated for our Easter Song of the Month.
we had fun with that one In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The text for this morning's sermon, the biblical basis for our thoughts together here this morning, are the psalm for the day. And in your bulletin, there should be a page that looks just like this that actually has it on it. Okay. In the first service, we do the psalm or the intro every day. We don't normally do that in this service, but this is what I base the sermon on. So I'd like you to follow along with me because these words are very important to the sermon today, all right? Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations, praise the Lord. This is your text. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Throughout the Lenten season and through Holy Week, we have been having sermons based on the Old Testament kings. 
especially the good kings that were found in the divided kingdom of Judah. And something you probably know about kings is that when a king is coronated, the people will usually say something along the lines of, long live the king. Okay. This is actually in the Bible. In 1 Samuel 10, 24, when Samuel is anointing Saul to be the first king of all Israel, it says in 1 Sam 10, 24, all the people shouted, long live the king. So, this is come. It goes all the way from King Saul to, I assume, it will go to Charles III. And I assume you noticed that the invitations to his coronation went out, and it says on the invitation, Queen, not Queen Consort, Queen Camilla. This was a big deal this week. I don't know if you saw that or not, but anyway. While it's a common expression at a coronation, it's kind of an odd statement. It's an awkward sentence. Long live the king. For you grammar nerds out there, and I know you're out there, long live, the word live there, is in the subjunctive mood, which is unusual usage in modern English. The subjunctive expresses wishes or desires. And I'll bet none of you this morning thought when you came for this sermon you're going to get a grammar lesson, so here we go. But a nation wishes its king will live long. Stability in national leadership is usually desirable. There's very little worse for a country, for a nation, than a quick succession of governments and the uncertainty that follows that. For example, here in the United States, if you're old enough to remember, when Richard Nixon resigned in 1974, there was much stuff going on before he resigned. Then he resigned, Gerald Ford took over for about two and a half years, and then he lost to Jimmy Carter. So we had you know, three different presidents in less than you know, three years, and that was different for our country, and that was upsetting to some. Over in England last year, you may recall that they had like three prime ministers in 30 days. And that did not go over well in England. All right. As the king goes, so goes the nation. And when the king dies young, the nation is usually left in turmoil. And we've seen all of this actually happen in the history of Judah in our Lenten and Holy Week sermons, our series on the good kings of Judah. But now we're at the end of Matthew's Gospel. And it pays to return to the beginning of his gospel to see how we got to this point. Because in the first chapter of Matthew, there's a genealogy there for Jesus. And in the middle of this genealogy are the generations of the kings of Judah. So like in verse, chapter 1, verse 8 of Matthew, it says, Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and so on. And these simple words are a stark reminder that one king follows another in life and death as they take their turns, life and death. Reading this might also bring to mind the old saying, the full saying compared with where we started, maybe you remember this one, the king is dead, long live the king. Now likewise, the structure of the book of Chronicles in the Old Testament is very clear. Whenever a king died, there was a burial story and then the beginning of the next reign and there were two key facts for every king how old the king was when he took the throne, and how many years he lived. And whether the reign was long or short, you could be sure that one king would die and another would take his place. The other key thing written at the beginning of each king's reign in Chronicles tells us if the king was good or if he was bad, if he was good or if he was evil. He either followed the ways of David or he abandoned the ways of David. And the point there is that the king had a large influence over the, the direction of the nation. A good king like David or Josiah would lead the nation in righteousness. But a bad king like Manasseh, and we talked about him Friday night, a bad king like Manasseh led the nation into evil. The blessings or punishments that were given to the king usually also came upon and fell upon the people as well. And this is a lesson we continually learn in history, whether it's ancient history or modern history. And we see this written in Psalm 146. So if you want to take a look at that again, verses 3 and 4, it says, 
Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Now it's true that we will often look to our political leaders, our political folks, rulers, we look to them for leadership. But there's no salvation in them. They live and die as ordinary people do. And even if the king or the president or the prime minister is wonderful, his successor might undo everything he did. And I can give you an example of that just from the last few years. And I'm not saying this to be political. I'm just stating that this happened in American history, okay? When Barack Obama was president, he issued a lot of executive orders that added a lot of regulations to our country that hadn't existed before. When President Trump got elected, he erased every single one of them by executive order. And then when President Biden was elected, he reinstated every one of them. Okay? So in the space of three presidents, it was on, it was off, it was on. Okay? That happens. Okay? And we also see this sort of thing happening in the Old Testament, in the book of Chronicles, when you have a good king who's leading the people to worship Yahweh, and so they're worshiping in the temple, and then a bad king comes, and he leads them in the worship of Baal, and they take all the gold out of the temple and shut it down, and then a new king comes along and fixes the temple back up again, and they start over. Okay. And so that's kind of what's being said there, what's being implied there, what we're being reminded of when we hear, the king is dead, long live the king. But there is one king in history who breaks this mold. Now, he came from a line of kings, but he was not born in a palace. Instead, the angel Gabriel announced his impending birth to his mother. An angel also visited Joseph, who was of the house and lineage of David, proclaiming that this new king will save his people from their sins. This one was hailed as a king by magi from the east, he was baptized as king with the Holy Spirit at his baptism in the wilderness. And Peter says in the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 37, that after the baptism that John proclaimed, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. And as Jesus went through the land preaching and teaching the coming of the kingdom of God and restoring creation, the crowds wanted to make him an earthly king. Indeed, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, riding on that donkey, we talked about this last week, the crowds crowd out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. But the crowd's reaction, especially after feeding the 5,000 that Jesus did, and after Jesus rose Lazarus from the dead, the crowd's reaction and their wanting him to be a king was based only on his power. Because they thought that anyone who would, could feed them for free would be a great king. And Jesus did ask for money while he was doing his thing. And so the people were thinking, the crowds were thinking, free food, no taxes, sounds great. It sounded great then, sounds great now, right? But instead, the only crown that Jesus wore was made of thorns, not gold. The only purple robe that he wore, since kings wore purple robes in those days, the only purple robe he wore was stripped off of him after he had been mocked and beaten. The inscription of his kingdom was posted on a cross and is simply read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. The day of his coronation was the day of his death. And that was not a long reign for a king, certainly the shortest reign of any king of Judah. But here's the cool thing. Here's what I think is the money quote from this sermon today. Here is the thing I want you to listen to. Here is the thing I want you to remember. When you leave this building and for the rest of your lives, okay? Are you ready? Are you listening? All right. The cool thing here is this morning we celebrate that Jesus is the only king who succeeded himself. Think about that, because I'm right. He is the only king who succeeded himself. He is the king of kings, and he lives forever. All right? Last year when Queen Elizabeth died, there was a lot of talk in the, and I'm really not a British file, by the way, 
Uh, but when Queen Elizabeth died, there was a lot of talk about the fact that she was on the British throne for 75 years, or however long it was. And that was a long time. Jesus has been on his throne for 2,000 years, and we're still counting. Okay. The Son of Man who lived without so much as a pillow to call his own was buried in a rich man's tomb. He had a reservation at a brand new tomb with a garden view. And the owner no doubt expected that to be a long-term stay. But Jesus left after just three days and two nights. And Jesus proved to be different from all of the kings who came before him. And he was different than all the kings who came after him. Because to begin with, he kept his word. He did what he said he was going to do. He said he would suffer and die and rise again on the third day. And that's exactly what he did. And you can put your trust in this king because he did what he said he would do. And there's salvation in him. You're not going to find salvation in any earthly leader. And further, even as his spirit departed, his plans were accomplished. He left nothing undone. It is finished, he said, right? His life's work of saving his people through the forgiveness of sins culminated in his death of, for the sin of the world. His plans didn't die on the cross and in the tomb, but were completed when he rose again on the third day. As his own successor, he didn't pass on his kingdom to a son or to someone else. He ascended to the heavenly throne, and he is now there as the king, as the Lord of all. As it is written, this is by Paul, Ephesians chapter 1. The Father of glory seated Jesus at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. This son of David, this king of kings, is an unusual king. Besides the fact he did what he said he was going to do. He didn't wage war against neighboring kingdoms. He didn't build, build a temple or a palace or city walls. He didn't preside over a booming economy. Instead, his mission was healing and justice. The mission of the Lord Jesus is summarized in Psalm 146. This is in that insert I gave you, verses 7 through 9. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. This is a different kind of king. And his victory was greater than all the kings of Judah because it was won over the last and greatest enemy. It isn't like he defeated the Philistines or the Hittites or something like that. Jesus defeated death, hell, the devil. And this was won through the forgiveness of sins which robbed death of its sting, as Paul said. His life of love changed the way people live. His life of love changed the way his people live and his death changed the way his people die because well <clears throat> really we don't die now this thing yes but not the soul Jesus Christ is the best king and this cycle of anointing a new king and wishing he'll be better than the previous one that's over it's done because he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He's here. He's there. He's everywhere. And he isn't going anywhere. There is good news today. We can drop the subjunctive. Let's go back to grammar here. We will change this expression that we started with on this glorious morning. Because remember, we started with long live the king. Well, that's not really right. It should be instead long lives the king. No more wishing, no more desiring, no more hoping. Put it in the indicative mood. Declare it. Say it's true. Long lives the King. This Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord, as it says in our text today. This is the best news. There is nothing you are ever going to hear or be taught or see or anything that's better than what I'm telling you here this morning. This is the best. 
As he rules, so goes his kingdom. And we have a kingdom with peace and stability under our King, our Lord Jesus Christ. For the Son of David was pierced for our transgressions. He has risen. He has ascended to his throne that we may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Just as he is risen from the dead, he lives and reigns to all eternity. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Amen. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may it keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. The worship team now has an anthem we would like to share with you now. It's Easter. We've got to do special music. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But he came and he died and he rose Those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we called death and grave they were like mountains that stood in our way, but he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. This is our God. This is who he is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, let heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away, faith so weak that we could bear. Nobody but him, this is 
Heavenly Father, please bless and receive these gifts which we give back to you from that which you have first given to us. Amen. We now stand for the prayers and petitions of our congregation. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, our strength and song, you have become our salvation. Receive our thanks for your generous deliverance in Christ Jesus, crucified and risen. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, in baptism you have joined us to Christ's death and resurrection and made us citizens of your kingdom. Move our hearts to repentance that we would set our minds on things above and be directed by your holy will. Lord, in your mercy. Almighty God, when doubt and fear weigh us down, console us with the certainty that Christ is risen from the dead and that he rules over all things for our good as our King and greets us with life and his means of grace. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Grant that all in authority would govern according to your will, maintaining order and curbing evil, that we may live in peace. Protect our military people including Tyler, Thomas, Chris, and Matthew, Preston, Evan, Cannon, and Teresa, David, Maya, Grant, and Chris, John, Ben, Debbie, and Seth, Kendon, Christian, Jacob, and Jonathan, Nick, and Hyojin. Lord, in your mercy. Hear Righteous Lord, you have, seated, you have seated Jesus Christ at your right hand for our deliverance. Remember those afflicted with illness and injury. We pray for those who are printed in our bulletin insert here this morning. And we add to that list, praying for Sarah Trowbridge, who is having surgery on Friday. And we also pray for the family of Kay, of Kay Hoker, who has been called to be with her Lord this past week. We also take a moment now and pray uh, silently in our hearts for all those that we know to be in need of the healing, the presence, the grace of Jesus. Give them health and strength according to your will. Sustain them in faith, knowing that for Jesus' sake, you will raise them in glory on the last day. Lord, in your mercy. O oh God, our strength and salvation as we celebrate Jesus Christ, who has been sacrificed and raised from the dead, bless all who partake of his sacrament. Cleanse us from boasting, malice, and evil, and give us repentant hearts to receive him in sincerity and truth. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed are you, Lord, heaven and earth, for you've, had the mercy, for you've had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. 
With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us to do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. The feast of the Lord is prepared for the people of the Lord. Come to the feast.
We stand for prayer. We pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same faith, in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you peace. Amen. We remain standing for our closing song, Christ is Risen.
God's people said? Amen. I thank you very much for joining us on this very special day, the best day, actually. And so now God be with you this day and this week. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.